Hi, I'm Justin Sheehy. I'm from Basho, and I'm here to talk to you today about REOC. And I'm going to briefly introduce REOC. Uh, it's a lot of the same things in some ways. You know, we all overlap in a few ways. That's why we're here together today. It's a document-oriented database, which you know, to us means just a little bit more than a key value store in a few ways. It's a decentralized system. It's fault tolerant, and I'm going to get into more detail about what we mean when we say that sort of thing. And it's all these other buzzwords, too. And that's actually what this talk is mostly going to be about. While I am going to introduce you to, to REAC and to what it is and how it works, in case you haven't seen it before, I'm going to leave out a bunch of its interesting features. I'm not going to talk about our event streaming interface, our pluggable backends. I'd be happy to talk to you anytime if any of you want to, as would anyone on our development team. I'm just going to give just enough of an introduction of what REAC is, how it works, and why we did it that way, so that we can then have another conversation that I think is about REAC, but is also about everything we're doing here at NoSQL, in terms of all these words we tend to say about ourselves. So a lot of us share some of the same influences and are standing on the shoulders of giants together. Uh, I am not going to run through all the details of the Dynamo paper again, though I am going to point at one or two pieces and talk about some of their consequences. Uh, the same is true of Brewer's theorem. Some of the other influences that have affected us all haven't been that kind of academic publishing. You know, we built our system to be on the web, but we also, when developing REOC, looked at the web as a distributed system, not a web server, but the web for lessons, because I don't think any of us can argue with the fact that it's the most successful distributed system out there. The web works, it's huge, it's grown like nothing else. And looking at it from a whole systems perspective is one of the things that drove us. And the other big underlying factor behind the way we thought about building what we did was the fact that a few of the members of our team have some pretty serious operational experience with some large networks. And we knew which things had hurt us in the past and which things were hard when you grew, when you had traffic spikes, when all sorts of things happened. And so we wanted to emphasize making that not painful and thus not costly. So I am going to briefly touch on a few elements of each of these, only so to show some of the consequences of them. So I'm not, for instance, going to explain what these parameters work from Dynamo yet again, N, R, and W, but I am going to show a couple of details about how and why we use them. So you've all seen at least one introduction to consistent hashing today. And we use a consistent hashing model very similar to Dynamo, to Dynamite, to a few other systems here where, you know, in our case, you can have an arbitrary number of servers. They each claim some number of partitions of your consistent hashing ring. You hash your objects into that ring, and you store that generally at the first n positions on that ring. This is standard Dynamo stuff, which is why I'm blowing through it. If, if there's anything in any of this that isn't clear to somebody in the audience, please raise a hand, and I'll go into much greater detail on this. But I'd rather not take that time if the audience is already fine with these topics. So the other parameters are where you can do things really differently, even thinking that you're implementing the same system. So for instance, you know, one of the things that, that Cliff brought up is there's different times that you can set some of these parameters. And we set the R value parameter for reads at request time. And this allows you to tune in your application to make different business decisions at the application layer. You can choose, you can trade off availability, consistency, and so on in different parts of your application at different times. And this has come in really handy for us. And it also allows you to you know, survive node outages in the case of capacity trade-offs. You can request a full quorum. And it gets a little more interesting when you work to the impact of your choices of the W value. You know, some of you that have worked on Dynamo-like systems have probably seen that there's some interesting math you can do with these. So if you want to get read your writes consistency, basically the, the least surprise, then you can issue a write followed by a read. And as long as the W and the R are greater than your N value, you get the kind of consistency people actually really want most of the time. It's different from the strong consistency that some people might like to talk about, where there can't possibly be any moment of difference between different parts of your system. But well, this one works even when a node is down. And 
another thing worth bringing up here is that you know this example that we, that I've shown here of you know using a w value equal to two, you know that allows you to in this case get a successful write even if one of those nodes is down. But actually in Reoc, due to the presence of the hinted handoff feature, it's very very hard to fail a write, and that's intentional. You know we emphasized write availability, and for us, that made that one of the first features to implement, just because that was a, one of our big priorities. And so what will really happen here, and I had a discussion with someone yesterday that made me realize that the hinted handoff might be a misnomer for us, because we don't even bother with hints. What we do is if we detect that one of these nodes has failed, we simply send that data to some other node under the pretense that that node does own that other partition. So in a case like this, you know, where whatever node was green here was failing, we just send it to the, the physical host owning the blue partition here and say, we're sending it to this partition. And we'd get a success, and that node would periodically say, wait a second, I have this data that's not for me, and attempt to hand it off. And it'll answer read requests. And by every node responding to any request in the underlying state machines here, we actually get much greater write availability even than you think you're often getting when you set these W parameters. And being able to set those not only at runtime, but to be able to take advantage of uh, hinted handoff has been great. Because you know, we had one case, you know, to, to actually do a little bit of lip service to Brad's request and talk about a use case here. We had a case in a real deployment uh, you know, of one of the apps running on Reoc, where we had two of the several application servers that were also running Reoc have a hardware failure in the same night. At the data center, there's a power spike. Two machines' disks went. You know, this is what happens, right? And we all got up, because you know, we're all thinking, got to make sure everything's working. And we, we looked at things and said, oh, well, the writes will still work. The reads will still work. Let's go to bed. We'll fix those machines in the morning. And we did. You know, we woke up. We looked at what was going on, because you know, we got a call from the data center. Oh, sorry, your machines crashed. They're not working. We said, thank you. We got up. We looked at it. Oh, we're still available. And that was the goal, and that was why we focused so hard on things like write availability. It wasn't to be able to say, we have write availability. It was to be able to go back to sleep. It was to be able to not have to spend a huge amount of money on people staring at screens, waiting for a light to turn red so that they could panic. And that has paid off hugely for us. So the folks out there that have seen things like hinted handoff in combination with these kinds of things in action, it's a huge benefit in terms of just that kind of peace of mind. Now, one of the things that we have in common with some systems here, but actually not much with the other Dynamo-based systems, is we also have our own type of MapReduce. And a Dynamo-like system, in this case, actually lends itself really well to MapReduce. Because the point of you know, the folks at Google coming up with the way of describing the MapReduce algorithms in the first place was to be able to do a lot of computation on your data without moving the data around, and instead by pushing the functions to where the data was. And the whole point of a consistent hashing system like this is to make it so that all your machines know where all the data is without having to ask anybody else. And you don't jump through any hoops to do any routing to determine where to send your, your functions. So not only can you create a map reduce, and this is just a very you know, simple chain of a, a map and reduce here. Um, but when you do so, the map functions get pushed out to whichever nodes they're going to be processing data on. Now, sometimes you're going to have to push that back up and run a reduce node somewhere else for aggregation. But most of your work gets done where the data already is. And you know, this is, for, from our mind, what MapReduce is best at. And I should point out quickly, just because there's a lot of confusion about what MapReduce is, not in the general sense. Everybody knows what the idea is, or at least a lot of people here do. But you know, CouchDB uses one kind of MapReduce for views. Hadoop has its own entirely different kind of MapReduce that they use for fantastically high throughput processing. Our MapReduce is different in a couple of ways. One of them is that it's targeted, and you don't have to run a MapReduce query on an entire body of data. Now, in a system like Hadoop, that's usually what you want to do because you want to do bulk processing. Or you know, in CouchDB, you're building a view over an entire database. But here, we treat MapReduce as a programming model. And so it's like a function. You feed it an arbitrary set of inputs, and it will process them. 
locally, efficiently, and give you the results. And that allows you to use MapReduce in an entirely different way. Because you can now, when you're issuing it on very small data sets, you can use MapReduce right inside the user loop of your applications. You know, within a, web, a single web request and response, you can execute these things very efficiently. And so you use it in a very different way than you use some other MapReduce systems. One thing that I also didn't uh, illustrate on the slide, but that's important about it, is you can set up one of these MapReduce jobs so that instead of feeding it a few inputs at the beginning like this, you set it up as a stream. And you can just pump data in at arbitrary speed. And as it's able to process out the end of the chain, it gets fed back to whatever receiver process you have. This can be a really nice way to interact when you're storing data. You can simultaneously be sending it through some MapReduce chain. Now, if you're going to do that, you need to be careful when structuring your actual MapReduce functions, it's very easy to have to, in fact, have basically reduce, introduce a barrier where you need to finish your stream before you're going to get any results back. Um, but it's still a very practical thing to stream your results in that way. And I said earlier that we modeled a lot of the way we were building this after the web. And in fact, MapReduce turns out to be a fantastic fit for one of the fundamental ways of expressing relations on the web. And here, I'm not talking about relations in your relational database, even though a lot of the same equivalent things exist here. The way the web expresses relations is with links. And the web works great at this. You can traverse all sorts of different relationships between data by traversing links on the web. And so we have built a number of applications on REOC where the data model the relations are expressed in terms of links between the different data items. This turns out to be really flexible because you don't need to go change a schema anywhere or do anything else to change that. You just add new links or remove them from objects in an ad hoc fashion. And MapReduce, in fact, is a perfect fit for this because you just want to hit each of these objects and extract links, potentially with some parameters. We allow you to pass in matching tags and so on. And so you can build whole applications, web applications or otherwise, where all of the relation following within your applications is this sort of a link traversal. And this example URL at the bottom is actually all it takes to do one of these. You know, if, if you've got uh, data structures like the ones you've seen passing by earlier, you can simply make a query. And after naming the actual bucket here, you simply name a bunch of specifications of links. And you know, these are wild carded out in a couple of places. Uh, but in this case, it'll do exactly this. It'll find all the artists. Uh, from that artist, it'll find all the albums and all the tracks and so on. And this, once we realized we could do this, it actually changed our speed of development on top of REOC enormously. Like, we were using REOC successfully behind our applications for about two years now. But it's about, about a year ago that we really introduced this. And all of a sudden, you had people that were developing the front end of an application able to express relationships entirely differently. And the amount of power that the developers got from that very, very easily, that you could just change one of these URLs and make a different query and everything worked, was huge. Shoot. Um, first off, congratulations. Relationships are very important, so congrats on that. Thanks. So if you remove track four, what do you need to update so then there's, you've got a couple options. It's a great question. One of the answers is that if you issued this as is and that object was simply gone, it would simply not be in the result set. The, the form of this is it would give you these four actual objects. You would actually get, in this case, a JSON array with the four objects. And if there's a dead link here, the default behavior in this particular example would be to try to follow the link and when it gets a not found, simply not include that. Simply stop following there. So if you delete something, a dead link is a lot like a dead link on the web, right? Well, you didn't find the thing on the other end of that link, but you can keep following all the other ones. Now, the function that's used to extract links from objects, you're allowed to, and in fact, encouraged to modify, add your own. It's very pluggable. So if you have a different desire, if you want it to cause a failure or do something else, if you think it's not OK, to have that, it's very easy to drop one in. Now, of course, the thing you really want to do when you remove that is then take another operation to go remove the link from the album. But the point I'm making is that you don't have to do that in one transaction. 
you can go remove the you can go remove the track, and you won't get it in the next walk. You should also just you know out of cleanliness take the link out of the album. But the user of this particular query won't be able to tell the difference. Thanks. So that was a brief tour into what I thought were a couple of the interesting features of React. Like I said, I'm, I'm going to leave a lot out because I'd like to spend the rest of the talk on a few of the things that almost all of us refer to when talking about the various things that bring us to NoSQL. Because I think a lot of the time, we're sloppy. And the terminology we use and the words we use, the things we refer to, the authorities that we claim to take things from, we don't all mean the same things. So I'm going to bring up a few of those, and I'm going to tell you what I think they mean. So we talk about Brewer's theorem a lot, right? Eric Brewer in 2000 at PODC, in his keynote, suggested this idea of the conflict between consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. A couple of years later, Nancy Lynch and Seth Gilbert formalized it and proved it true. Great. I'm not going to explain all the details. But I hear things like, well, we have cap. Yeah, of course you do. Everything does. That's the point. That's what makes it a theorem. What you need to talk about is how you deal with the consequences of knowing that this is a fact. And this is also something that gets oversimplified all the time. People think that what got proved was that consistency, availability, partition tolerance, pick two. And all those bad relational database guys, well, they picked consistency, so they only get to pick one other one. And we're not going to pick consistency so that we can get the other two. It's subtler than that. What Nancy Lynch and Seth Gilbert proved was that at any given moment in time, and a moment in time can be really, really short, you only get to guarantee two of them. You still want all three. You still want all three all the time. What you have to choose is when you're willing to make compromises on which of them at times that would otherwise cause you to lose them all. So we didn't choose two. We tried to help you find ways to choose the levels of relative consistency, availability, and partition tolerance in your application that makes sense for your application at any given time. So I'm not going to say, you know, which of these two we, ch we choose. That's not the point. By doing things like, but not only, exposing the RNW parameters and so on, the idea is to help the application programmer express their priorities. So you don't have cap and you don't pick two. You pick what compromises you'd like to make. And if you're willing to compromise on any of them at any given moment, you have a lot of flexibility in determining how your application will behave in the real world. So that's the cap theorem. It's not pick any two. It's pick two at any moment, and you can change which ones those are anytime you want. So another thing worth bringing up, React has an HTTP API. A lot of things do. It's good. I'm, I am perfectly willing to stand up and say, yep, it's a RESTful API. You know, we deliver it using, using web machine. It's a very straightforward web interface. And it wasn't by accident, right? When building Reoc, we were following the web. The web works great. And so the underlying fundamental data model, it's not that we found out how to fit HTTP on top of it. We said, we're building a system that's about the transfer of state to and from applications over a network, and there's one really, really successful way of doing that already. So I think if that's what you're building, if you don't speak HTTP, it's kind of confusing, because this is an excellent fit for application state transfer. So we've chosen HTTP as the way to interoperate with things, and it gives you cacheability, intermediaries. We have some native interfaces, too. But by being of the shape of HTTP, we were also able to make sure that the fundamentals of how you interact with REOC are something that people have been paying attention to for a long time. And so we can reason about what it means to do, you know, to do a get, to, to handle cached results, to do all these things. If you invent new protocols, new ways of doing basically this, you don't just invent the protocol. You then have to figure out what all the consequences are. And when you're shaped like something that has a huge amount of real world fire, already, you get the world's experience. 
And so HTTP was not an afterthought or an accident. It seemed like the only reasonable choice for the shape of our protocol. So probably one of the favorite other words people use is scalable. My system's scalable. Great, awesome. So I put this sentence up here. I can add you know, twice as much something to get twice as much something else. If you don't have a sentence of this general shape that you can fill in the blanks on, you're lying when you say you're scalable. It's not. Scalable is not about big. Scalable is not about fast. Scalable is about a ratio of cost. So you know, for example, in, in React and in lots of other systems, the thing you think about adding to fill in the first blank is usually more computers, more systems. It doesn't have to be. There are other ways to be scalable. But when you talk about typical horizontal scalability, that sort of thing, you're talking about computers. You could be trying to get more of a lot of different things. So you could be trying to get more right throughput. You could be trying to you know, just pour more data in. You could be trying to store more. Uh, if you're a MapReduce system, you might be, want to be able to process data faster. In React's case, all the variations of this are true. When you add more computers, you get more of all of these things. Now, you don't have to fill in the blanks the same way. You know, you can say, I'm scalable in terms of this and this. But remember that that's what scalable is. It's not about how fast you are, how big you are. It's about understanding and predicting how much it's going to cost you to get better. Something that's scalable isn't necessarily even good at the thing you plug it into. You can be really scalable in terms of storage capacity and not be able to hold enough. All that scalability tells you is the ratio and how much you need to do, how much you need to spend to get more. Now, there's one other thing in the sentence that I hadn't pointed at yet, so I will now. I said, you know, twice as much x to get twice as much y, because I'm talking here about the kind of scalability we usually implicitly mean when we're saying it's a good thing, which is linear scalability. But again, scalability is really just about understanding that relationship. How far over do you have to push x in order to push y up? And if you're building a distributed system that is handling data in any interesting way, you should know what sentences like this are true about it. And if any of them are, yes, you're scalable. But if all you say is you're scalable, you've told me nothing until you fill in these blanks. So you know, I'd like to ask, just like a couple of these other things, that when we use these words, we help each other out, just like we're doing by explaining our systems to each other today, by saying what we really mean. So you, know, you can say, you know, we, we're scalable in terms of you know, storage capacity per machine. Yep, great. Now I know what you mean. Fill in the blanks, or else scalability claims are entirely vacuous. One of the other favorite words, and probably the easiest one to use, because it's almost always true, is distributed. Everybody here is talking about a distributed system. Since that's true, it's not very interesting to call them all distributed. You know, it, it's a wonderful word, because as far as I can tell, if you're on the network and if you're speaking over a network protocol, well, OK, you're distributed. I'm, I'm not going to argue with you. That's fine. Great. But I haven't learned much of anything. So I want to say a little bit more. And there's a few other useful words that we could add. And in React's case, a couple of the ones that I'd add are decentralized. There's no center. There's no master. There's no anything like that. And furthermore, it's a homogenous system. I mean, not only is there no center, there's no special roles. Every machine takes its share of everything. There's no name node, master node, no spoffs of any kind. When you add a machine, you add a machine. You tell it to join the cluster, and it joins the cluster. It takes its share of work. It can handle requests. It can store data. That homogeneity was actually core to the operational ideas we were talking about before. Because there is very few things that will make your operations person in the machine room happier than you saying, oh, I don't care which machine it is. It's OK. Turn it off. Take it out. You don't have to go figure out which one it is. That's huge. And when you're reconfiguring your systems, figuring out, oh, well, well now I'm going to add this kind of node, so I need to put it over here next to these. No. Just add machines. And that homogeneity has given us some of the predictability and operations that we wanted. And so that's why I'll happily tell you, sure, React is a distributed system. So are a lot of things. So much so that just like when you say scalable and don't fill in the blanks, if you just say distributed, all I think I really know is that you're listening on a TCP socket somewhere or something like that. Tell me more. I want to know more about the way your system is distributed 
or else I haven't learned anything when you tell me it is. So another thing we'd all like to be is reliable, right? We don't want these things we built to fail. We want them to keep working. We want everything to work. We want robust components. I agree, we do. We should all work to make the components we build and the software we build be reliable, be robust, do all sorts of things to make it deal well after a crash and so on. That's great, but it's still going to fail. It is. If you ask anyone who spent any time operating any large collection of systems, something's going to fail. Maybe it won't be a bug in your code, maybe it will. Maybe the hard drive's going to crash. Just talking about reliable components doesn't get you everything you want. So again, as much as I like building reliable things, and I think we should all build robust things, that doesn't get you where you need to be. Because what I wanted was a system that was resilient. And a system that instead of trying to prevent failures, or in addition to trying to prevent failures, assumed that they're going to happen. As you get more machines, or as you live longer, you have more and more chance of more and more failures. In your code, in someone else's code, it doesn't matter. Something's going to fail. So what's important is not just that you build robust components, but that when you're building a distributed system, and I really did mean that general sense of distributed now, that you know what the overall system's behavior is when things fail, when anything fails, because it's going to. And this is actually another case where the homogeneity that I mentioned a minute ago helped us a lot. We have less different kinds of failures to consider. If you have a system built out of all sorts of different components, and you really do want to understand how resilient that system is to failures, you've got a really complicated spreadsheet of work to put together to figure out what the different combinations of failures you could live with are. In our case, we mostly just have to count them. And that's useful. And that helped us. It didn't do the work for us. But it made it so that we could take an approach to whole system design where we understood the ways in which it was resilient. And of course, it's easier to be more resilient in terms of uptime when you have robust components, but it doesn't get you the whole way there. And now maybe everybody's really favorite term. Um, thanks to Werner Vogels, who started really popularizing this term, and now everybody uses it, especially when referring back to the fact that they've got the cap theorem. Um, so it's true that once you recognize the impact of the cap theorem, you'll recognize that if you want to have availability and partition tolerance at the same time, sometimes you are going to have to compromise consistency briefly. Yes, know what you mean when you're doing it, and that is not actually an excuse for losing data. Eventually consistent shouldn't mean sometimes I lose data in order to make sure that everything eventually converges. Eventually consistent is just like the compromises you might make really briefly for availability or partition tolerance. Something that once you're done with that compromise, you still have everything that users have sent to you. And you don't lose data. And that's hard. And just you know, finding ways to converge isn't enough. You have to find ways that converge that are going to satisfy your needs in that system. And so in order to demonstrate that, I'm going to talk a little bit about partition tolerance and vector clocks. I'm not going to explain how the vector clocks will work. For those of you that aren't familiar with them, the really quick version of what they're for is that since you cannot count on wall clock time in a distributed system, if any of you are relying on wall clock timestamps from two different systems to figure out much of anything interesting, you've got a bug. Vector clocks are about a kind of limited partial order that's causality based over the events that have happened in your system. And it lets you figure out which things that you see, which documents, which whatever you've annotated with vector clocks, you can guarantee resulted from some earlier version being seen. And so you can determine which things you can safely throw away in a way that you simply can't determine from a wall clock. So say we've got a four node React cluster, which is a weird number of nodes, but it helps us make a point here. And we got a perfect partition here. We got two on each side. So for one thing, when we talk about partition tolerance, we don't mean the majority side still works. The, the internet's not that nice to us. You don't get to count on a majority. You're, and I want the minority to still work too. So in our case, we actually allow you to continue having write availability on all sides of a partition if you choose to. So partition tolerance to us is not just write off some of your machines. 
And so in this case, we're going to consider these two pieces of our cluster to continue working. And so now after this partition, they've both got some document in their store, and we'll say that its content here is v0. And while they're partitioned, the cluster here on the left writes some data, overwriting its copy of that document. The network partition goes away, the cluster merges, and this is where vector clocks help us. We can tell immediately from looking at those two documents, because they're annotated with vector clocks, and because the vector clock on this side got updated relative to the v0 one, when these merge together, we can look at them and say, aha, v1 descends from v0, pick it, done, everything's great. The ugly case, of course, is if they both modified it. And this is where we get to the point about wall clock time not being good enough. In this case, they both modified it. They both have documents that descend from v0. They both have documents that don't descend from each other. We can tell. When they come back together, neither one of these documents is more recent because the relative time on those machines is not interesting and is not useful to us as the database. It might be useful to the application sitting on top of React. I'm not saying you should never look at your time. But from the point of view of something that doesn't know what application is sitting on top of it, you need to actually know whether or not one of these documents is newer than each other in a logical sense, not just whether one machine thought it happened a second later. So in this case, REOC will in fact tell the client every time, oh, you've got multiple copies of this document. You know, you, there was a conflict created. You, here are all the copies. Here's a vector clock representing them all. You can modify and push that back in. We don't guess which one to give you. And there's, there's all sorts of ways you can choose to guess. You can, you can pick by some determinism out of the naming. You can pick based on wall clock timing. I claim that if you do that in your database, you're making the wrong choice. Now, we make it really easy for you to plug in your means of merging this. And it's very easy. It's just flipping a switch to say, my application for this class of data when I have a merge, yep, I will take the one with the later timestamp. Because, you know, in this case, a little bit of that kind of sloppiness is fine. You could also plug one in that says, well, this kind of data structure, the right thing to do, maybe it's a shopping cart, is to run a set union on them and create one thing out of the union. Maybe, in some applications, the right thing to do is say, oh, this is really important. I'm actually going to bubble this all the way up to a human user and say, hey, you have a choice to make. And you know, if any of you have ever tried you know, syncing all sorts of mobile devices with your laptops, you've probably been presented with that choice once or twice. And that's because whoever wrote that software knows that you'd be angry with them if they lost you know, your wife's phone number. It, it, some of them will lose it anyway, but, but at least they're giving you the choice to help them lose it. And that's the difference. You can make bad choices, and we won't try to stop you. You can choose to say, oh, no, I always want to pick based on timestamp. And you flip a bit, and that happens. But by making that choice for people, you're going to be wrong some of the time in a way that is effectively the same as losing data. And you know, I've heard a few things about how vector clocks are cumbersome. Vector clocks, you know, why would you do that? Why don't you just want a plain old get and put? No, they're cumbersome for us to write, but they're done. There's, no, there's nothing hard here. When you do a get over this, we package up the vector clock. And all you have to do is push it back when you go back. There's nothing hard about this, but leaving it out has a huge cost. It means that you cannot fix this problem. So solving partition tolerance to us means keeping write availability everywhere. And it means that what happens on one side of the partition doesn't get lost just because the partition's moved. It might get lost because you told us to lose it by pushing in a function that does that. But we won't throw it away. We won't hide it. You won't have to go looking to figure out if it's there. And to us, that kind of reliable presence of whatever changes you've made was more important than cushioning people from this choice. You can cushion people from this choice. You can make it never be there. And the system seems a little bit easier to use. And sooner or later, it's going to surprise you in some way that you know, could really burn. So those are a bunch of the things that we all say about a lot of these, and you know, I have some fairly strong opinions about the right and wrong ways to solve some of these. I suspect some other people do too. But I want to emphasize again that making some of these choices right doesn't make a system have to be hard. 
Because one of the things we focused on all along, we were building applications on React before we were giving it to other people, and now we have some happy customers using it and happy open source users using it. But React is a system that's very, very easy to develop on. You know, vector clocks don't get in the way, having to set RNW don't get in the way, all these things, it's easy for you to either set defaults or use them. You know, we've had developers come up and running, you know, in a week, writing applications that were using this richly. And, you know, I credit that to the fact that it's, you know, using HTTP, uh, easy to use JSON, it's easy to define your own data schema, it's easy to use entirely schema-less data. The basic operations are those of a key value store. Even though we have a few more interesting things like events and MapReduce and so on, when you start using it, you start using it just like something you've used before. And it doesn't just scale up. It's lightweight and it scales down. And in fact, you can do this dynamically, uh, which ends up being a pretty big deal. I've heard a couple of times, you know, why, why do you ever need to shrink, right? You, you, it, it, it is pretty important to be able to dynamically add machines which I very much agree, and we've made it, you know, it's a one-liner. You just say, join that cluster, and the React node does. You can also say, remove that cluster. And from spending a bunch of time in operations, I'll tell you, that's about as important. Say you've got some huge public event coming up, and you're going to over-provision like heck for that event. You're, you're going to. Someone's going to tell you, make sure that there's no way we're going to run out of capacity for this event. So you double your capacity. Do you want to have to rebuild your whole cluster over again the day after you've gone through that? just to get those machines back, being able to remove things and being able to scale down. And I don't just mean it could be smaller. I mean being able to take an existing system and scale it down is sometimes just as important as scaling it up. And in Reox's case, the low end of the spectrum is really low. You know, I've run uh, a couple of dozen server instances on this two-year-old MacBook. Uh, so people can develop against a full-on system. You can run you know, a full cluster that behaves just like your deployment cluster on your laptop, and that allows developers to develop their applications against an environment that behaves identically to the one they're going to deploy on, not to something that doesn't replicate and isn't really part of a cluster. That avoids a lot of bugs. When people don't develop against something that is shaped like their operational si situation, you discover bugs when you push to production, which is not when you want to discover them. And like I said at the beginning, we also care about this being easy for ops. We've suffered huge operational pain before we had React, and we've taken it down a lot by having this. Like I said, we've got the adding and removing nodes I was talking about. I'm going to hit again on the homogeneity. That makes alerts on your machine so much simpler to deal with. You know, there's no, oh, no, no, the, the, the special super hyper node is, is down. No, there's nothing special. Everything should just alert the same. Yeah, you care when you're running out of disk. When you're running out of disk, add another machine. Guess what? Some content will get moved. Machine's down, OK. Remove that node from the cluster or add a new one or just wait and bring it back up later. And that part of that, the adding and removing nodes, the homogeneity, makes it really easy to change almost any part of the configuration of your React cluster over time. Not just adding and removing nodes, but almost anything that's configurable about React isn't something that you have to, you know, go sync out a bunch of new configuration files and stop everything and start everything all over again. It was very important to us to have a system that we didn't have to turn off ever. And that has allowed us to feel like we get to stay in control of what we're doing. We get to sleep at night. And during the day, you know, we're already relaxed from at night. So during the day, we can be a lot more excited and develop apps really easily that we're happy with. And so that's what I wanted to say both about React and about a bunch of the terms that we all use. Uh, I'm interested in hearing what any of you have to say. Thank you. So the default behavior, right, so, so, so Josh asked if we retain version history backwards after you change the document. So when you push up a new version, do we keep the old one and prior ones? Is that correct? Yeah. So React itself does not do that. We, you know, we actually had the ability to just switch that on in one of the earlier versions of React, and we found that the pain of compaction frequently and having to do that sort of thing was actually pretty large on frequently changing documents. We've got a couple of mechanisms people have used that I'm happy to share if people want to have documents that merge 
in such a way as to retain their history. And you can always get a document, put one back, and say, change this. And we've done that. We've had applications where, at the application layer, objects are defined as having history. And it's pretty straightforward to interact with Reoc in ways that you choose which objects have history. But our choice is to have the default behavior and the, the core underlying storage engine not keep history. We keep the vector clock, which tells, which tells you where it's been, but not the content. Sure, so we provide, we, so the, the question is about the structure of the links and what you have to do to have link walking work. Uh, so we provide one particular structure and one pre-parameterized way to do link walking. So if your objects are expressed in JSON and they have the right keys in them, then it just works out of the box. You don't have to do a thing. However, you can set one parameter at application start time to say, here is the function over that bucket of documents that takes an object and an arbitrary tag, which is just an argument, really, and tells me, based on that object and tag, what the links are. So you can parameterize how to extract them. So if you have some object, you know, one really straightforward one is if the objects, instead of being JSON, say they're XML or HTML. You know, you can use any of the standard ways of parsing XML to produce your actual links out of that. All you do is you point once and say, the function's over there. Reoc itself doesn't really know anything about the structure of any objects. We just happen to have one or two of these functions provided off to the side that you can point to by default. I can't see, but I'll listen. Yeah, sorry. Um, so having the homogeneity of roles within a cluster is quite good. Um, what do you tell the ops people when they say that the actual hardware is not homogeneous? Great. So the question was about uh, how do we deal with the fact that hardware is not homogenous. You know, you can start out by buying, you know, however many you want identical machines, but over time you're going to probably want to deploy different systems, different amounts of RAM, different amounts of disk, and take advantage of that. The way that we do that is that a couple of the core behaviors of a node are parameterizable, just like link walking. So, for instance, the function that a node runs to decide how much and which partitions on the consistent hashing ring to claim, that's parameterizable. The default behavior is to take, you know, floor of my fraction, right, to, to act as though everybody's homogenous. But if you have different machines and, and this part is, you know, your problem, the application programmer, you have any way of telling them apart. We don't, we're not a systems analysis tool here. But if you can publish back any way of saying, you know, this is a, a 3x machine or whatever, then it's very easy to say, there's the function that says how much of the ring I want, and so on. And so that will just cause that node to not claim as much of the work. So currently, there's nothing fundamentally geographically aware. But it's funny, all three of these answers, I come down to almost exactly the same thing, because there's that element of picking your portions on the consistent hashing ring. Uh, also matters here, because it's not just about how many you pick, it's about which ones you pick. And so if there's some awareness of the fact that we're generally going to send a replica to adjacent partitions on the ring, you can push in a parameter that determines whether you want you know, this type of machine and this type of machine to try to either never be adjacent or always have two in a row, and so on. So there's not a fundamental geo-awareness, and I'd be perfectly you know, happy to help if people are doing things with rack awareness and so on to to start integrating that into some of those functions, we provide the place for you to plug in that data that helps you decide you know, where you want your various dispersed machines to be in the space of data. All right, well, thank you all for listening. <laughs>